the range of the Logos title in the prologue to the fourth gospel by Gehardus Voss. Notwithstanding the great amount of exegetical labor expended on the fourth gospel, much of it with the special end in view of ascertaining its doctrinal character, some of the foremost biblical theological problems to which the gospel gives rise still remain sub judice One of these is the question of the precise reference of the chief Christological titles employed. Are these titles given to Christ from the point of view of the pre-incarnate state and thence carried into the incarnate life of the Savior? Or does the evangelist use them of the incarnate Christ exclusively so that they lack all bearing on the pre-mundane and pre-incarnate stages of our Lord's existence. In the former case, their significance will not be confined to, this, to the sphere of soteriology, or of the Christology in its purely sociological aspect, but will extend into the doctrines of creation and providence, and may even reach up into an ontological problem of the divine nature and mode of existence as contemplated in themselves. As indicated by our form of statement, there is no absolute alternative involved. Reference of these titles to the pre-incarnate Christ does not exclude, but includes their application to the incarnate life as well. The exclusiveness is found with the defenders of the view according to which the names describe the God-man and predicate of him something that is true only in virtue of the incarnation. What applies to the original existence of Christ will remain true and continue operative in the life on earth, but the rules does not work conversely. That what applies to the incarnate state must necessarily reach back into the life preceding the incarnation. The sole point at issue therefore is whether the attributes or functions expressed by the names under debate first originated with Christ, appeared in the flesh, or whether their emergence in the earthly life of Jesus is a mere continuation in a new concrete form of something that had been pred predicable of him before. In order to preclude confusion of thought, another distinction should be drawn at the outset. It is one thing to ascribe to the evangelist the use of one or more of these names as significant of relations and functions pertaining to Christ in the pre-incarnate or pre-mundane state, and quite another thing to believe that he uses them loosely by way of anticipation where he speaks of the Savior's original existence fully conscious that in the strict sense of the term, they belong to the later stage of his life. The mere fact that one of these names and some pre-incarnate or originally divine attribute are joined together cannot, without more, be held to prove the inherent reference of that name to the larger or eternal aspects of Christ's person. The use of a name is often far wider than the range of its inherent significance or the point of view which originally determined its choice. When certain things are affirmed in connection with the Logos, it by no means follows that he is called the Logos in virtue of these things or even was the Logos when these things took place. The evangelist's intention 
might simply be to affirm the things referred to of him who afterwards and for other reasons came to be the Logos. We shall, therefore, have to put the question sharply in each separate case whether the function affirmed is a function of the person of Christ in general, here incidentally called Logos, or a function specifically connected with his Logos character. A Logos function as such, the nature of the function inducing the use of the name. The three titles in regard to which the said difference of opinion prevails are Logos, Son of God, Only Begotten Son, or God Only Begotten, as more or less formal names of the Savior, they are clearly distinct from other des designations which partake rather of the nature of descriptive metaphors. It is true, Zahn denies this of Logos and would consider it as a figure entirely on a line with the life. The light the vine. Even when the evangelist singles it out from among other metaphors applied to Christ, to use it as subject for a number of statements, this is done, Zahn thinks, with full consciousness of the metaphorical intent, so that in order to render the writer's meaning exactly, one would have to paraphrase, in the beginning was he who may be fitly compared to the word of God, etc. It is, however, doubtful whether the gospel ever uses other conceptions such as light and life without additional qualifications. Entirely after the same fashion as Logos, to designate the person of Christ in the concrete, the prologue says, the Logos was, but in him was life, and the life that was in him was the light of men. The life and the light remain abstract conceptions, although, of course, their reality is concentrated in the personal Christ. In verses 7 and 8, it is true the light is used as a designation of the historic Jesus. By the side of this may be placed chapter 3, verses 19 through 21. Although here the personal interpretation is not necessary. But even so, there remains a perceptible difference between such a way of speaking where the identification of the person with the abstract idea is led up to by previous statement and the procedure of verse one in the prologue where wholly without preliminaries, the word is introduced as a fixed designation. We have sufficient warrant, therefore, for placing the word on a line with the other two designations as a formal name of Christ. The various positions taken in regard to these names may be classified as follows. First, there is the extreme view of Zah who would restrict all three to the manifestation of Christ in the flesh. Zahn, of course, finds in John the doctrine of a real pre-existence of Christ, but in his view, no denomination applies to the pre-existent one as such except the simple God. Next comes the view 
which after the same manner restricts son and only begotten, but allows an exception for Logos regarding this at least as a name applicable to the pre-incarnate, if not the pre-mundane, Christ. Among the advocates of this view may be named Leek, Luther, Weiss, Beschlag, and Harnack. One step farther go those who begotten together with Logos to the pre-mundane and pre-incarnate Christ, but place the simple son this side of the incarnation. This is given as the view of Biedermann and Schnaz, formally resembling it, but with a different distribution of the names, is the view of Belser, who, like Zahn, makes Logos a designation of the incarnate Christ, but speaks of the eternal, only born Son of God in his historical appearance. Making both the other titles refer to the Savior in his pre-temporal existence. Finally, are those who make the simple Son follow Logos and Monogenes into the class of names descriptive of the pre-existent eternal Christ. Among the numerous representatives of this group may be named Godot, Meyer, Kiel, Koslin, Hilgenfeld, Scholten, Immer, Toma, Flitterer, Lipsis, Oscar Holtzman. It is moreover the view which has behind it the weight of authority of the Orthodox Church tradition from the time of origin onward. A glance at these several views and at the distribution of the prominent names connected with them suggests the following significant fact. The traditional exegesis of the Orthodox Church in tracing back these distinctive names of Christ to the state of pre-existence receives support from the foremost representatives of the extreme critical school, which in its estimate of the date, the provenance and the historical truthfulness of the gospel stands at the farthest remove from the conservative apologetic position in regard to such matters. And on the other hand, the great modern apologetes of the gospel who have done so much to vindicate the orthodox view of the church in regard to its apostolic origin and trustworthiness show not seldom a tendency to part company with the church exegesis so far as the titles under review are concerned, assigning one or two or even all three of them to the incarnate Christ and insisting in the same measure upon their non-applicability to the eminent Godhead, the opposite of which the orthodox theology has always emphatically maintained its interest lying in the defense of the deity of Christ, which seems so obviously bound up with the pretemporal reference of these names. The phenomenon here noted is not, of course, an isolated one. It furnishes but one striking instance of the curious alignment which in exegetical and biblical theological matters tends to group together conservative scholars with their extreme critical antipods and to force apart the same conservative scholars from such as are their natural allies in the great critical debate. A high exegesis is joined 
to a low critical view of the gospel and a high critical estimate of the gospel in the case of the apologies is accompanied by a low exegesis but mystifying as this alignment at first sight may be it is quite capable of rational explanation the negative critical school especially in its older Tubingen form, contended that the gospel is essentially a philosophical, theological document, that it contains speculation and not in the main history, and that in this speculative complexion, the teaching of Jesus, which it pretends to record, is radically distinct from and irreconcilable with the kind of teaching preserved in the synoptics. It is therefore natural for this school of critics to find not only a solid substance of doctrine in the gospel, but also to consider doctrine found of the highest speculative type. Now this inevitably brings their exegetical conclusions into close touch with the church theology. For the church has always found in the fourth gospel the main source for its teaching on the deep things of the Godhead. On the other hand, it is but human in the apologies of the historical character of the gospel to endeavor to approximate its doctrinal content as much as possible to the current conception of the synoptical teaching of Jesus for the simple reason that thus one of the chief obstacles to its historicity can be removed. Thus it comes about that a certain predilection, not only for an unspeculative, but even for an untheological and undoctrinal interpretation of the statements of the gospel, can be observed in apologetic circles. The tendency becomes doubly strong where it receives reinforcement from the widely prevailing Ritzelian and antipathy to everything that savors of the speculative and metaphysical in Christian teaching. Harnack's exegesis of the gospel, with its sharp distinction between the speculatively colored prologue and the absolutely undoctrinal body of the gospel and its refusal to recognize the prologue as in any sense a program for the gospel teaching, make it a mere accommodation to the standpoint of the readers, clearly reveals the influence of this latter motive. But the tendency as such is not dependent on this secondary influence for its existence. It is plainly perceptible in cases where every suspicion of Richelian sympathies is excluded, e.g. in the case of so orthodox a writer as Zahn. For such as still set store by the great theological doctrines for which the fourth gospel preeminently has furnished the basis and therefore continue to attach not merely an historical but also a specifically theological value to its teaching. The tendency spoken of may easily seem fraught with the danger of depriving whatever success has attended the apologetic efforts on behalf of the historicity of the gospel of much of its value. One may be inclined to feel that the historical character of the document has been saved at the expense of its theological importance. We are encouraged to maintain or regain our confidence in the actual provenance of this body of teaching 
from the lips of Jesus. But somehow in the apologetic process, which has restored our confidence, the former richness and pregnancy and distinctiveness of the teaching seem to have been lost to such an extent that we are no longer able to reap from it any appreciable addition to our store of knowledge obtained from the synoptical sources. As already stated, among the doctrines thus affected, the Christological, the Christological truths which have always been considered characteristic of our Lord's Jahani teaching stand out prominently. Among these, again, the Logos doctrine occupies an important place. It is a matter of considerable moment, theologically speaking, whether Christ bears this name in connection with his appearance in the flesh and his soteriological activity, or whether it belongs to him in virtue of what he is and does apart from and antecedently to his work as incarnate savior of the world. In attempting to register the theological consequences of the adoption of the former view, we naturally think first of the doctrine of the Trinity, specifically of the relation within the Godhead between the Father and the Son. The name Logos has long since been understood as intended to throw light on this Trinitarian mystery. The point of comparison is given a psychological turn and the thought results that as the Logos stands related to the person who produces it, so the Son stands related to the Father. In other words, the idea of the eternal generation of the Son by the Father is found expressed in the Logos name. The name characterizes this generation as an intellectual process. The ontological interpretation or the Logos name, either in this specialized or in a more general form, is not confined to the older and oldest exponents of the church theology. It still finds advocates among modern exegetes, both of the Orthodox and of the liberal school, although, owing to the fact that this question is seldom raised in a sufficiently pointed and explicit form, it proves difficult to ascertain the opinion of most writers in regard to it. This is the end of the sample portion of this document. It is free to download below.